If you have questions along the way, um, feel free to interrupt me. So why are we here? Well, one of the things that, that I want to make sure you guys do is come out with a sense of what, what of knowledge about a variety of different computer systems. Uh, so I, I'd like you to be able to understand after this course, you know, what, a, what an operating system is and what its parts are, what the internet as a system is, uh, things like what, e how Ethernet works, just all this good stuff that you really need to know in order to be a good uh, computer scientist, computer engineer, and also things you need to know in order to um, be able to build s systems. Second thing, um, which is extremely important in uh, systems, uh, in computer systems, is I want you all to be able to understand how to critically analyze a system. So when someone comes up to you and says, hey, I just you know, wrote this mumble, th mumble system and gives it to you, I want you to be able to look at it and really understand what's interesting about it, what's not, how to respond to when someone says, you know, what do you think about it, in a very intelligent and structured way. I want, to, I want you guys to get some practice synthesizing your own system design. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about that later. Um, and the last one here, I mean, you see the first two are learn, the second two are practice. Systems is all about practice. I want you guys to get practice presenting and debating your ideas. Uh, systems is a very different type of field in computer science, in computer science and there's a lot more practice uh, involved in being able to do systems. And of course, the last thing is next month, you guys are going to be doing Philip's course. And Philip is very demanding. And it, the stuff that you guys learn here is going to, is going to serve you quite well uh, in the next month. Questions so far? So one caveat here is to be prepared for something completely different. In systems research, there's, I shouldn't say no uh, uh, categorically, but in general, it's very hard for there to be a wrong or a right. This is very unlike what you might have been used to in the algorithms course. You know, either an algorithm is order n squared or it's order, order n, or you know, either it's asymptotically you know, approaches this or asymptotically approaches that. Uh, it's, that's very cut and dry. You can prove it. In systems research, it's very different. There is, it's very hard to say my system is right and yours is wrong. And so be prepared for a little bit of, of that type of, of feeling. It, it, can make, it can feel a little bit fuzzy. Um, the, uh, the second thing is that it's very important, as I, as I uh, talked about before, that you learn how to critically analyze computer systems. And so here, unlike, unlike when you analyze an algorithm where you say, oh, well, here are the things that I need to know, you know, order this, you know, how fast it, it's, how well it scales, you know, what, under what conditions it's more applicable than this other algorithm. Here, um, it's, it's a lot more difficult to say, well, here are the criteria that I'm going to use or here are the ones that I'm not going to use because everyone has their own set of criteria. So hopefully by the end of this course, you'll have some idea of what your favorite criteria are and what your favorite way of applying that criteria is. Um, as w one other thing about systems is there are very few theorems, there are lots of hints, and there's mostly case studies. So unlike, again, mo most of your previous courses, a lot of what you're going to be seeing here is all about examples, examples of this system, example of that system, example when this works, example when that doesn't work. But it's going to be, you're going to be, see very little of, you know, here's a theory that tells you when this thing is going to work or when that thing's going to work. All of this is going to create a lot of perceived fuzziness. Um, it's ine inevitably, in the, at MIT, when you see people taking this course, the first few weeks, sometimes even the first month, people are sitting there thinking, am I really learning anything or am I really getting it? And, and part of that is because, you know, you read some papers and you say, okay, well, I know how Ethernet now works, so I know how this works. But you, what you'll realize towards the end of the course is that that's only part of what you're supposed to get here. The other part, which comes through practice, is this analysis, uh, being able to analyze, critically analyze systems, being able to debate with someone else. Uh, uh, properties of systems, that debating, that present, presenting, that's what's going to come as you, as you go through this course. That's going to come later, and it's not going to come very easily initially, but that's the thing that you have to, be, you have to understand, that that's what you, you really sh your goal should be to learn that. Anybody can read a paper. If you're smart enough, you can understand every, every aspect of it. Not everybody can critically analyze you know, what's important and what isn't and compare that to another system the same way. So... The thing that you're gonna that you're gonna be learning here is how to take this perceived chaos of all these different systems that you're gonna look at and turn it into something that represents a little bit more order, a little bit more structure. 
So that said, participation in this class is everything. Uh, I don't know if the TAs have assigned, have they, have they assigned the groups yet, Shai? The, um... I don't know. Did Mike sign up last night? Yeah, Okay. You guys are going to be working in groups of two. And the assignments, there's going to be daily reading and writing assignments. Um, and what, what that's going to culminate in is every, in every recitation, there's going to be three recitation sections in general. Not, not today, but in general, there's going to be three. In every recitation section, you're going to have a, um, everyone's going to have, each group is going to have to come up with a presentation of the, of what their, of yesterday's, uh, or the previous day's writing assignment. One is going to be selected. One, one group is going to be selected. You're probably going to be giving a presentation two or three times during the, during the, um, the month. And uh, the recitation is going to flow that way. The first person, the group is going to get up, give their presentation, answering the question or the, the discussing what they learned about the paper according to the previous day's assignment. And then the rest of the class is going to is going to engage in a discussion, debating debating their point of view. And the TAs are going to be there to make sure that everyone you know gets into the whole the whole swing of things. Um, and that's going to be an important part of your grade, as you'll see in a bit. There's going to be a quiz. The quiz is going to cover um, the readings that you have to do, and it's going to cover anything that comes up in discussion and recitation. The TAs are going to make sure they, that certain points do get brought up in recitation, so it's important that you're there to discuss them because in the quiz you'll, you might have to actually take a side and, and present a case. And then there's going to be a final project. Well, this, is, this is where the fun begins. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's, I'm, I'm calling this Survivor AD Uni. There's going to be a, approximately 17, 17 teams, and there's going to be one survivor team. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to write and defend uh, either NSF or, or ARPA systems, computer systems proposal to win. And the people who are going to decide are mostly you, but with some help from the teaching staff. And the, person who, the team who wins gets fame, fortune, and a handsome reward. I'm working on the handsome reward part, but you definitely will get fame and fortune here. Um, the details are going to be forthcoming, uh, but <laughs> what's that? I'll settle for the fame and the fortune. I'll settle for the <laughs> the, um, the details are going to be forthcoming, but the thing to keep in mind is this is one of the reasons it's important to make sure you participate all the way through because every day is going to be something else that you learn that you can apply, that you're going to be able to apply to the final project that's going to make your team uh, superior to the others. <laughs> well, what is an NSF ARPA system? Um, well, NSF, National Science Foundation, and ARPA, they are both government agencies that fund research. And uh, they very frequently put out RFPs, which are requests for proposals. And they'll put out something and say, okay, we want a request for a proposal for um, a terabyte, or, or uh, sorry, a teraflop computer. Or they'll say we want a request for a proposal for the Internet 2 or something, something like that. They'll give some guidelines. What will happen is um, researchers around the world will write proposals saying, I propose to do this, to, to, to answer this RFP with this type of research. I've you know, done this already that supports that I can do this other thing. I'm going to need this much money to do it. And here's why my system is going to be much better than everybody else's system. And so that's the kind of, it's not going to be, I mean, I'm not going to want you to write, you know, some 50-page proposal, but it's going to have a lot of that flavor, and what you write in that is going to have to be something that you can defend and that you can compare and contrast against what other people write. And the topic is? Haven't chosen it yet. Oh, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose the topic. I'm going to choose the topic. It's probably going to be based on, you know, I'm going to try to get a feel for what, you know, people like and, and I'll see what's available and, and try to choose something across those two dimensions. I was thinking we could really send these into NSF and ARP and try to get them all funded. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> on solid ground. <laughs> there you go. Why not, right? <laughs> what do you have to lose? Okay. So any questions so far on this? On this? Okay. <clears throat> So grading, um, your daily assignments are going to count 20% of your grade. Uh, it's typically going to be a writing assignment. Uh, the TAs are going to be grading it on a five-point scale, giving you feedback. Um, one other thing about the daily assignments is they're t they're, I'd like you to do them on one page, you know, front side of one page, uh, single-sided, 12-point, half-inch margins, 
I mean, the idea is I don't want a book. I want something that's very clear, concise, that shows that you understand what the, the topic of discussion is and something that you can present well to, to uh, both in writing and to your uh, recitation section. Are these done in the groups or these were all doing these individually? Actually, I, I, originally I thought they probably should be done in the groups, but I think because of this is a, an opportunity to learn how to write well, um, not that you don't, but, but to write well in terms of systems, uh, I think it's better that it be, they be done individually as far as the writing assignments go. Now, in recitation, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a team that needs to present. So you don't, you're not going to know whether you're the team cause that's going to be presenting, so you all have to come prepared to present to each uh, recitation. And your participation in that recitation is going to be another 20% of your grade. Now, that's going to include, if you're not the team presenting, that includes you being able to ask, you, know, you being one to ask questions or to stir up debate. That's going to count. That's very important. Um, the quiz is going to be another 20% of your grade. And then the final project is going to be 40%. That's where it's all going to matter. And this is something you can't cram for. If you don't start day one really understanding what's going on, it's going to be difficult to be the survivor. I forgot to mention the other part. If you don't win, if it's going to be shame and agony. So, <laughs> so you almost win. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> um, no, it's actually going to last over the course of a couple days. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna, there's going to be one big round that's uh, the way I'm looking at it right now. There's going to be one day when there's an el elimination round, and there's a few that are going to be left. And the last day, there's going to be a lot of scheming and conniving between everybody to figure out, you know, who the who the who the per who the survivor is going to be. And there's going to be, you know, some some rules that I'm going to set up to make it to make that very interesting. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Who wear brass rats and the ones who don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk about that after class. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like everyone to use the AD Uni website. I've already, I don't know if you've checked it, but I've posted the, the class syllabus on there already. I've posted the assignment for today. And I'm going to be posting regularly these lecture notes that I do and anything else that's, that's relevant. Um, there's a systems B board that I created. I'd like you all to subscribe to it. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask me, that's probably the best place to put them because that way the whole class can see what the answer is. Uh, and I, I mean, I encourage you to use it. The TAs are going to use it. Everyone, I hope, is going to be, is going to use this as a, as a learning medium. Are you going to post the lecture notes? I'm probably not going to post the lecture notes beforehand. I'm probably going to post them afterwards, uh, you know, the day of the le the day after I lecture. Okay. I guess, I guess like, a lot of people think it's helpful to have them before because then, you know, when you go through the stuff, you can have a paper. Yeah. Let me let me think about that. I. I've, I've kind of debated back and forth with, with what's better, and I also find the other side of that is that sometimes people will read them and then fall asleep and say, because I, you know, so I, I've, I just, why don't we, we can talk about that later. Um, so just a little bit about me. Just I've been talking up here, and some of you may have no clue who I am. Um, some of, I've interviewed some of you, so I, you may remember my voice, and you may remember the bank, bank vault pr uh, problem that I gave you. Um, just call me Luis, uh, and uh, I got my, uh, I'm an MIT guy all the way. I got my master's and bachelor's there, and I got my PhD there um, in 97. After that, I spent a couple years at McKinsey uh, learning about business, and now I'm working at Photo.net, which is, uh, as you, many of you know, is uh, part of, uh, is being incubated at Ars Digita. Um, Photo.net was started by Philip uh, 93, 94. Uh, and the saw and the ACS, which is what Ars Digita's ba its business is based on, out grew out of uh, Photo.net. Um, I have my website up there. It has all my my phone numbers, all my information. So if you ever need to reach me um, during or after the class, uh, feel free to go there. And I, I'm giving you a couple of emails here that you can use if you need to reach me directly. Okay. Questions so far. All right. So let's get into systems. So what is a system? For this, just to give credit where credit is due, um, Salter and, Ka and Kashok are the uh, two professors who are teaching the systems course at MIT. And um, this, this part of the presentation um, is, is heavily 
uh, draws heavily from, from their uh, teachings. So they define a system as a set of interconnected components as a specified behavior observed at the interface with its environment. So what do all these words mean? Well, when you define a system, one thing that you have to do is say what's in the system and what's out of the system. And the pieces that are in the system are what we call the system components. Everything else is called the environment. The interface are, is where the inter interactions happen between the components and the environment. And in particular, a computer system is a system that's intended to store, process, or communicate information. So with that, can someone give me an example of a computer system? Okay. With the processor and the chips and the stuff. Okay, great. Now, what is the what are the components? Things like uh, a display, a processor, uh, the ribbon cables, and the. Okay. The, uh, Good. Good. Can everybody hear that? Disk. Display the ribbon cables, the disk drive, what all the stuff that's in. What's what's where's the interface? Keyboard and the screen and the network Boards. connection. Keyboard, screen, network connection, key, uh, mouse pad, things like that. Okay, so from a software point of view, this thing, you can look at this thing as just, it's a box that runs software. That's another valid description of this system. Okay, so where am I going with this? Well, when you, the hardest part about describing a system is deciding what the components actually are. And it's very important that before you discuss any system with, any, with someone else, that you make sure that you, uh, that you define what the components are, what the environment, and what the interface is. Now, a couple of ways, a couple of metrics that you can use to, um, or guides that you can use to help you define what the components are, is first, decide what's, what's the purpose of it? What does it accomplish? If you look at the computer as what it is right now, which is basically a projector, really all it is is, you know, PowerPoint and some video out, right? And who cares about the rest? I don't care if there's a disk drive or there's, uh, if there's just a bunch of memory in there or, if there's a CD-ROM, I mean, that's all, the, that's all irrelevant from that point of view of the, of the system from its purpose. If its purpose is to do a lot of number crunching and, do, and, and figure out where all these bits are going are gonna, to, where these bits are going to be displayed, then I'm interested in the, the, the FPU, the, the, the floating point processor in it. I'm interested in its computational power, how fast it's going to get these things up there. So make sure that you are very clear. Don't don't be fuzzy or vague about this because it'll get, it'll it'll bite you really hard. Make sure that that you under that both everyone understands what the purpose of the system is that you're talking about before you start a discussion on it. Second thing is the granularity. It's very easy to to look at this as oh it's you know a, a box a screen hard a hard disk and so on. But you can actually go deeper than that. Right? What's, when you look at the pro, you can say, oh, here's a processor. And what, what about the processor? Well, it's a bunch of, you know, layers of silicon. And, and what about the silicon is made up of all, you know, inside the silicon, there's all these gates. And in there, there's all these electrons floating around. And they all are obeying these quantum laws. And the question is, you know, what level of granularity do you want to study the system? Well, it depends. Right? If you're looking at this as, well, you, as just um, a box that crunches numbers, who cares about the quantum properties of the electrons running around? But if you're looking at this as, well, here's a system, and let me look at scalability, and let me see how fast I can, I can push it, then you might start thinking about things like thermal qualities of, of the, and how much power is being used. So make sure that when, you, when you're thinking about a system that you very clearly in your mind know what the purpose and the granularity of it is. When you read these papers about systems, these are a couple things that if you don't understand the components, the environment, the interface, purpose and granularity, you're going to be lost. So if when you, when you start reading the paper, if you feel like you don't understand those, you, I would recommend you just write them out so you, you, under, you, you can go back to those notes. Make sure you talk to a TA or to someone, or to, or someone else immediately to, see, to make sure that you're on the same page and you really are starting from the right place. Question? Abstraction can be, that's a very good question. Abstraction actually is a way of controlling the granularity. So um, one example for that, that Salzer and, and that's in the Salzer book is um, think about a, uh, if you're looking at a system which is the Earth-Moon system. At one level of granularity, you can abstract that out to be a point, 
point mass. Right? If you're looking at the solar system as a whole, you might model it as a point mass. That's an abstraction over it. If you're looking at, at it as a, if you're looking at the tidal forces on, or you know, the, the, the ocean and the ocean, then maybe looking at it a point, as a point mass isn't really the right way. Maybe you want to actually look at different properties of, of it that are at a, a, a finer granularity. So abstraction is a way of controlling what granularity you want to, to look at a piece of a system with. Other questions? Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> See, batteries. No one mentioned batteries as part of this thing. Uh -huh. What would be the interface of the Earth-Moon system? Um, it depends on, on what the uh, it, uh, depends on what the purpose of it is. Um, one of the interfaces you could say is are the gravitational forces, uh, the way the, because that's one of the ways it interfaces with the re with the comets that fly around or with the the, the uh, with Mars when Mars gets you know. But those are gravitational forces are weak, so it really they only come into play when something is close. Um, another thing you may look at the interface is ref reflectivity, right? So you know the moon you get moonlight. Right, that's it. Interacts with the the, the moon interacts with the the, the um, Earth, in the sense that it re, it gets it reflects sunlight onto the Earth, which has you know biological effects and so on. So again, it, it goes back to that, but that's why it's important to you know are we talking about moonlight or are we talking about gravity? You have to d decide what you know what it is that the purpose of the system is, and that'll help you clear out all the other things that aren't key and all the other interfaces that aren't key and focus on the ones that are key. Other questions? Uh, the relationship between the system's behavior that we choose to observe and its purpose, should be those seem the same thing? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a matter, it's a matter of deciding what's important and what isn't. There are a lot of behaviors that a system will have that may or may not be important. So, you know, this thing here is drawing power from the power grid, yeah. right? It, that, that may be important at, if we're talking about, you know, how much is, is the battery, is it going to turn off or not as a, as a system, and how robust is it? But um, it may be important in that case. It may not be important if I'm just thinking about it as uh, something that it, I want to number crunch very, you know, give me an answer in a second because it's probably not going to go off, turn off, you know, in the next second. So, so while many behaviors may theoretically be observed, we choose and we choose to focus yes. on when those are dependent upon that's right. And in fact, that's being able to decide which ones you want to focus on and, and which ones are important is part of what you need to learn um, in this course when you, when, you re when you learn about a system. And in fact, when you debate each other about systems, you're going to find that some of that debate is going to be around, well, what do I think is important versus what you think is important? And then you're, you're going to have to debate, well, why does my thing that's important, why does it matter, and why does your thing not matter? And it may be that both matter, but it may be that both matter in the context of different purposes. And so that's, you can see how that, you have to structure your debates around, you, know, you have to be coming from the same place before you can even get into a debate about whether some you know, proper interface is better than some other, or some uh, property of a system is better than some other one. Because if you're not agreeing on the purpose, then you're probably going to have, a, you're probably going to be comparing apples to oranges. Other questions? Okay. What's all that? Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. So why build systems? Now that we have some idea of, of you know, how, how we can think about them, um, there's a variety of reasons why. Uh, one of them is speed. And I'm going to give you examples of all these just so that you can get a sense of you know, what the variety of things out there are. One is speed. Um, SETI, do you guys, who knows what SETI is? Okay. I don't know if it's running on these computers over here. Uh, but you know, SETI has a ton of data. They, they need someone to, to crunch it. Their computers are too slow to, to, crunch, I mean, to, to crunch all of it as it comes in. So what they're doing is they're uh, allowing uh, anyone with a computer hooked up to the internet to do their number crunching for them and, and find, you know, the, find ET. Um, biological simulations, as you know, the human genome has been somewhat, somewhat mostly sequenced. Um, there's a lot of other organisms that have had, have had their genomes sequenced. Uh, one really interesting thing to do is to be able to use, to be able to use all the computational power there is out there to start simulating what's going to happen when you do, when you do this mutation or when you introduce this protein into the system. Um, very hard to predict. Decryption. 
Uh, a few years ago, there was actually, and I think it's still ongoing, there's, there's uh, some folks who had this contest. Um, it's RSA, I believe. In fact, RSA had a contest where they uh, encrypted some strings, and they used uh, ha uh, progressively harder and harder encryption, and they have prizes associated with anyone who decrypts these strings. And uh, a while ago, there was uh, some guy who organized a, a study-like system and and they and the guy said, okay, I'll tell you what, it's a ten thousand dollar, I think it's ten thousand dollar prize. If yours is the computer that decrypts it, because he's distribute, he's paralyzing it a lot, then I'll split the prize with you. So you can imagine, everyone just started running this thing, and and eventually it was very quickly um, decrypted. Uh, so speed is is a one reason. Uh, fault tolerance is another. If you have power outages, uh, if you have bad components. Building a system, you can use you can use what you learn in systems to build fault tolerance into a computer. Um, there was a, oh, what it, there's there was a machine a while back. I, I don't exactly remember the, the the manufacturer. And there was some commercial they had where they took some bullet, some rifle, and just shot it, and it just kept chugging. Um, and this is the kind of machine that if you know if you're a bank, you probably want to have, right? Because this thing isn't going to go down, and, and if it does go down, you're going to lose a lot of information. So fault tolerance is another, another reason you want to build. Um, reliability. And this is, uh, this is a, a little bit harder to define, but the way I like to think about it is that once the system tells you it's done something, that it actually, it actually has done it. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but you know, sometimes you'll you know, here's a system that sometimes doesn't do that. You'll call up, you know, a credit card or something and say, you know, has this, you know, have you received my bill? And, oh, yes, it's already in the system. And then the next month you get some late notice. Right? That's an unreliable system. Um, another unreliable system that, uh, another way that reliability can bite you is, you know, you're in, you're save, you save a file and then the computer crashes right after that. And then you come back and the file isn't there. It's corrupted. Right? That's not a reliable system. When the thing says it saved the file, you want to know that it's saved the file. And if the computer crashes, it's when you come when it comes back up, it's there. Um, security. Uh, there's intentional and unintentional uh, security threats. Uh, who knows what a denial of service attack is? Okay, denial of service attack. Uh, one example is uh, well. Why don't you why don't you give us an example? a service such that no one who legitimately wants to use it can. Okay. Can you give us an example of one that's ha had happened in the news over the last six months? Um, you, you flood um, DNS servers so no one can find out where machines are on the internet. Okay. So Microsoft had this Microsoft. problem recently. Microsoft, um, it, you, there was, a, a, time, there was a, a period of maybe, I think it was a few hours, maybe almost a day, where if you try to go to Microsoft.com, you just couldn't get there. And the servers were up and they were running. They were ready to, to, to serve requests. But the problem was that, that there's a, a service called domain, DNS, Domain Name Service, that translates Microsoft.com into a numerical address that we'll learn more about this later, where, so that, such that a computer can uh, find where this other server is. And that service was disrupted because some hackers started overloading that service with too many requests. And so denial of service means that you, there's a service that's available and some hacker comes in and does something, either shuts the machine down, floods the, floods the machine, does something to prevent anyone else from accessing that service. Um, now, as much as, as people like to talk about it, um, uh, these, these sort of outside threats um, from outside hackers, uh, actually the, the worst security threats are from inside a company or inside from people who have access to the inside. So uh, I actually, um, while, I, while I was at McKinsey, I actually worked for a large telco um, who had a, a security product. And they told me that, that for them, most of their clients, like, mo the majority of their clients were concerned about outs outside threats, but they were most worried about disgruntled employees going in, deleting files, changing data, you know, or, or someone trying to you know, beat their, this other guy who's, who was going to get a promotion, you know, sabotage, that kind of thing. And it, I mean, it's, it's all it's stuff you see in movies, but actually that was their biggest, that's how they made their money, was, was keeping the people on the inside from doing these kinds of things. And they built systems that helped you, help a company protect itself from these types of employees. Um, there's also the unintentional, uh, you know, security threats. You know, you're typing stuff, you're borrowing your friend's computer and you accidentally delete their Windows system directory or their slash, you know, slash uh, dev directory or something like that. 
could be a disaster, um, but and systems can help you protect against that. Availability, anytime, anywhere. If you just have one computer, and you know, it's probably not going to be available anytime, anywhere, especially if it's running some version of Windows. Uh, but you can build systems that will help you, even if you're running Windows, to get better uh, anytime, anywhere access. Robustness. If you, this is related somewhat to fault tolerance, but I like to think of robustness as you're a lot more tolerant of input, but you're very strict with output. So if I, if you have some some system like a uh, uh, the internet, and you throw some a bunch of packets on there that have that are that are not not a, you know uninterpretable, that are just kind of bogus, you don't want the whole internet to to come down crashing. You want um, the, you want the system to respond very gracefully. Another example is if you pull a hard drive out of a computer, wouldn't it be great if the computer just kept chugging along, maybe a little bit more slowly, but <laughs> just as if you know it's still doing all the stuff. Well, there are systems that do that uh, called RAIDs. Uh, maintainability. You want to be able to your system. One of the reasons to build system is so that you can repair, you can maintain, you can upgrade, and you can enhance the system without bringing it down. And people, people who love these kinds of systems are, you know, banks, financial institutions. Um, of course, we all love it because we like the internet to be that way, you know, not to come down just because some link, you know, gets severed because someone's down in some manhole, you know, and cut something. Uh, and the last one is scalability. This one is a really, really important point. Ideally, what you want, I'll just draw this very quickly. Ideally, what you want to be the case is that as you increase the the load, um, I'm sorry. Actually, the this is the so this is performance. So what you want to be the case is that as you increase the load. And I don't know, you can measure this in, I don't know, number of requests that you can handle, so on. The performance follows a linear, a linear path. Sorry, the other way around. If you, um, it goes, it, it does this kind of thing. As you increase the load, if you, it, you have a linear relationship between load and performance. So what that means is if you have a, say you have a one processor, uh, computer that's doing all these steady computations. If you put twice as many on there, you'd love it to be the case that it, it goes, it does them half as in half, in twice the amount of time, right? If you want it to also be the case that if you put another processor in, that it can handle twice as many in the same amount of time. So this is this, this linear relationship between performance and load is something that's ideal that you'd love. No, very few systems have anything like this, but what you don't want is what you, ha what I have up here, what you don't want is there is the load to decrease exponentially? So you don't want it to be the case that that another unit of work creates uh, slows the system down by half or by a third or by a quarter, because then you very quickly the, you can load the system up and then it just it just completely dies. Philip is going to be talking a lot about scalability um, in his web services. He'll say that the ACS is very scalable, and you'll have to question him a lot about it, especially <laughs> what you learn in this course. Um, but what, what he's talking about are things like as you increase the number of, of hits per second on this web server, right? The web server grace, gracefully, the performance of the web server gracefully decreases. And at some point it'll hit a wall, but what, what you don't want, what he'll say is that some other services, when you put them up there, that they very quickly decrease into, into a, a state where the performance is just losing and you can't use the service. Um, We'll talk more, a lot more about scalability later. But main thing is here's a set of, of reasons why you build systems. But when, you, when you're thinking about what's, what's also here is a way of looking at systems, of analyzing systems. So when someone gives you a paper and says, you know, here's my mumble system, right? And what do you think about it? Here are some dimensions that you can use to say what you think about it. You can say, oh, it looks like it would be very reliable. Uh, but not very available. There's other reasons that you can add here, but use these as a framework for when you're starting to f look, read these papers and critically analyze them. These are words that a lot of, that anyone in systems will understand uh, and that you should be very fluent in. 
people may ask you, you know, I may ask you on the quiz, you know, what do you think about the, how well this system scales or how well this, the, how robust this system is? And I'll expect you to come back and be able to say, you know, this is what I think about it. Questions on these? Yeah, could you uh, give a few examples of what exactly you mean by availability? And is that like mobile computing or if you're talking, what? Okay, availability. So availability, one example is think about the internet, right? You want the internet to be available anytime, anywhere. So is that true? Is it, ava is it available anytime, anywhere? More or less, okay. Any other opinions? Well, what, I mean, what does anywhere mean in terms of if I don't have a computer in front of me, it's not. Okay. Right. If, you don't have a, if you don't have a, okay. a connection to it. Okay, if you don't have a connection to it, good. So there's, it's, not available, it's not available necessarily anywhere. But you, if you have wireless, it might be. But not every place is wired up for wireless. Now, if you do have a connection, let's say you have a hard connection to it, is it still available anytime? No, <laughs> and, and why not? Right. Okay. Good. So I mean, so we're starting to analyze the, the we're starting to analyze the availability of the internet, and we're finding that in general, some people feel like it's always available, but there's actually examples of where it isn't. What's a system that's a lot more available in terms of, of any time that you expect to be available any time than the internet? The What's that? The atmosphere. The atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's built by humans. <laughs> the telephone system. Good. You expect that to be available any time. You, I mean, there are, there, are, there are some countries where you pick up the phone and it's, you might not get a dial tone. But fortunately for us in the US, for the most part, it's available any time. What's another service that's available that, that's available anytime? Electricity. For electricity, you're expected to be available. You have some power outages. California's not too happy about this stuff right now, but it's a, it's that. So, what about anywhere? Ham radio. Ham radio. Okay, that's an interesting system. It's a distributed system. There's hams all over the U.S. It's uh, if you're anywhere near, I mean, even out in the, you know, out in less populated places, it's likely there'll be somebody out there who um, is listening on their ham and, and will respond. And I've done that, and it's quite fun. Um, what else? Anywhere, an anywhere system. Yeah. Pardon? GPS. GPS. I love that one. Okay, that's the the purpose of GPS is to be an anytime, anywhere system. Right, and unless you know one of you know, some magnetic storm from the sun comes over and wipes it out, or you know some missile goes up, it's it's probably going to be mo for for all of, for all of us, it's going to be anytime, anywhere. We're not going to be going down into the ocean very deep anytime soon. I hope not. Um, so th so this is the kind of thing. See, we're we're analyzing systems on the dimension of availability. Um, when you start critically analyzing them, like if you're thinking about the design of GPS, if one of the, what if one of the things that you have to do is have anytime, anywhere access, you have to come up with specs. You have to say, well, what does anywhere mean? Does it mean that I have to be, does it have to work for planes? Does it have to work just for people you know, around sea level? How below, much below sea level does it have to work? Um, that's, I mean, obviously you're not going to get this thing to work at the center of the earth with the current design. So you have to you have to decide what anywhere and any any time means, and then you have to look at the system and decide when you're reading about it. Decide, is this really? Do I really believe that the system would would do this or not? Other questions? Are, are there any of the other of these that people want to discuss and go through that are a little vague or? or... Okay. So what makes a system hard to build? Um, well, in general, it's complexity. And uh, so complexity is, 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 again, I'm borrowing from uh, the Salter, et cetera, book, is lack of understanding of the system's behavior. And the problem with when someone says complexity is it doesn't mean the same thing here as it did in your last course. Okay, here, there's no real absolute uh, way to measure it. So what we look for when we're, when we're analyzing how complex a system is, is we look for symptoms of it. And here's some symptoms. There are others, but I think these are generally the most, the most uh, important. One is a large number of components. 
Another one, and and just because one of these is true doesn't mean it's necess- it's complex. It usually, is a combina- it has to be a combination. Second one is that there's a large number of interactions between the components. That's a big one. Um, third one is that there's not very much regularity in it. So that makes it more difficult to, which ties into the next one, it makes it more difficult to describe the system methodically. And a very telltale sign is that it takes more than one person to really understand it. So what's a, someone give me an example of a complex system. Pardon? The genome. Okay. Genome. There's a large, there's lots of, lots of, uh, genes. There's lots of interactions between the, the genes, actually between the DNA itself and all the proteins in the cell. Um, there is a lot of regularity in the structure, but not in the sequence itself. Um, oh, I take that back. Actually, there's a lot of regularity in the, in the, in, the, in a lot, parts of the sequence. Um, it, uh, it, you can probably describe the you can probably describe DNA pretty methodically, but no one understands what it no one understands it very well. I mean, you can understand there's a lot of understanding of it, but in general you can't I mean, people don't know what's what, can't predict what would happen if you change certain uh, certain as, certain genes mutated them one way or the other. What's in it? Can someone give me an example of a of a computer system or information system that's complex? Unix. <laughs> Unix. Um, I think that, I mean, the, the last one, uh, with the exception of, I don't know if, if uh, Torvald knows this, understands the whole thing. Maybe he does. Um, but it's very hard for any one person to really understand how the whole thing just fits together. Maybe Stallman does. I'll take that back. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, uh, let's move on. So where does complexity come from? And one of the things that you may argue when you're designing your system is like, I just won't make it complex. You know, what's, what's, why can't I just not make it complex? Well, it turns out that there's uh, three different reasons why it's very hard to, to design a system that's, uh, that does anything useful that's not complex. Um, and the biggest problem here, uh, which you can conclude from the previous one is, Previous slide is what to really understand something you need to be able to have predictive power. I don't know if you've in some of the other classes if you've if you've uh, if you studied that in terms of uh, predictive power. But if you don't have predictive power, you don't really understand a system. So that's why quantum you know quantum mechanics is real. The, the physicists love it because it's it's you have huge predictive power over how these these part these wave particles are going to interact and what they're going to do and it's it's I mean, it's it's all it's always it's brought them a lot of uh, a lot of joy and satisfaction. What they hate is when they can't predict, you know, what's going to happen at the end of the universe or at the beginning or whatever the current theory is. Same in systems. Systems, folks, they're, we're always looking for for ways to predict how systems are going to are going to react and what they're going to do and and along those different dimensions that we saw before. What you're going to find is it's in general it's it's very difficult to predict and the the really the only real way to to under, to know what it's going to do is to actually do it. Um, so that's why one thing that you have to be careful of is when someone comes up here and says, you know, oh, I know what my system will do under these conditions. It's either they've done it before, or they're probably you know there's some margin of error and for and before and you have to be able to to look at that and say, you know, wh- why do you th- you know is that BS or not? So this is the kind of thing in recitation, especially, that I'm going to expect all of you to do. And one of the big mantras is, you know, when someone makes a prediction about how something's going to react, that's a place that you need to dive in. So, so how does that work? We suppose you have like a complete statistical, statistical description of your system. Is that would you say that's predictive or not? Um, well, that getting a complete pred- a statistical description of the system isn't that easy. Like, for example, here's no, a system. You could. Then you have some probabilistic. Yeah, yeah, and that's what quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics is a complete statistical description of the wave properties of of types of of light. Or, so or would that, you call that predictive? Or not predictive? I would call that predictive. So you could probably argue that a complex system is any system that is too hard to do that with. Yes, 
Yes, as soon as you get past the, the point of being able to, to predict. Now, you could argue that, well, you, can't, you can't argue that, well, for some systems, I'm interested in only a small, and the purpose of the system is only to address this subset of issues. And within that subset, I can model it in a way that allows me to predict pretty easily, you know, what's, what, what the behavior is going to be. And that for, I mean, that, that's where a lot of, that's where you, why you can engineer things, right? You can take a car and you can predict, you know, you can predict how, you know, when, I'm sorry, better example, you can take a copier. This is a great example. You can take a copier and you can, for, for a lot of different aspects of it, you can predict when certain pieces are going to fail. And Xerox actually did this um, about, I think it was about 10 to 15 years ago. They, um, what they did is they took measurements of all of t tons of measurements, and then they put all these measure uh, of copiers, and then they would notice when they would fail and what they would do, and blah blah. blah. They put this in this huge uh, database and had this um, program that would that could run through and and look at all of these things very quickly. Then what they did is each copier that they sold after that of that same model they would have it phone home every night. And the, the information that it would phone home with was all the measurements that it took that day. And so this, this big program on the other side would sit there and look at all the measurements and compare them to what it knew and then come out with some prediction of what part was going to fail when of the parts that it was monitoring. And so this was great because, I mean, before that, the, the whole purpose of engineering this system was you wanted, you know, availability was the big thing. You wanted, and reliability. You want this thing, this copy to always be available, always be reliable copies. And so you would sit, people would sit there and try to engineer the parts to work perfectly, and they just got more and more expensive. With this type of approach, now you can get, you can get parts that are okay, that aren't that expensive, because even though they fail more often, you'd have a good idea of when they're going to fail. And so the typical story you would hear is like the, you know, the customer would be there and they get a knock on the door and they say, who's this? It's, it's a Xerox repair guy. And they say, well, my copier's working fine. And they say, won't be working fine tomorrow. <laughs> and he just replaces the part and that's, and, and the, and the customer sees no downtime. So, so in that case, you do have a lot of, you do have a lot of predictive power over that. But nevertheless, there's still pieces of it that would fail outside of the scope of that. Yes, Shai. Luis, is there a trade-off between predictive power and and the granularity of your system? Because the the, the, the higher level of abstraction, it seems the more likely you'll be, you'll be able to make some kind of prediction. And the more you go down into the details, perhaps the less likely you'll be able to, to control your predictions about what's going on. I think it, it, it that it varies. And let me give you one example. Um, which I actually, I actually have as one of the examples later on here. Take this computer here. If I look at it as just as a, as a processor that takes power and that its speed is, is related to how much, how, how much you know, current and, and what the clock speed is that can pump through this thing, then from that's a very abstract point of view. It's very simple. And that relationship tells me, well, the more I clock it, the more power it's going to need, the faster it goes. But if you look down at a, a lower level of detail, which is what are the thermal properties of this of this chip? I mean, who's who, I don't know. Has, have, has anyone here ever overclocked the processor? Yeah. Overclocked? Okay. So they saw uh, what what happened when you overclocked it? Um, well, one of the, one time I did it, uh, the serial controller got out of sync with the, the processor. I couldn't control it. Okay. So that so you start other parts of the system start start failing because and there's no you know, abstractly, they should all work, right? Because everything's running off the same clock, and, and so it, that failed. Has anyone ever, ever had a catastrophic failure? <laughs> and that's, <laughs> I love it. Um, there's, I have to find this URL. There's, um, there's some guys who, uh, who took a, a four, just, uh, just so everyone knows, overclocking a pro, the processor, um, works at a certain speed, 33 megahertz, 300 megahertz, something, something like that. That, and the, what the processor basically does a, a one step of work every clock cycle. And so overclocking it means you make it, you, you double the speed at which it does. So to do, when you double the speed, it's going to need more energy to do that. So it, it consumes more, more power, more current. Um, but that energy needs to be dissipated because there's resistance for, for that current to flow through. So it generates heat. Um, so that what these guys, these, these guys did is, um, 
I don't know, they bought, they bought a bunch of bottles of booze and then they decided, okay, we're going to take our 486, you know, 486 chip, 33 megahertz, and we're going to run, we want to run a version of Quake on it. And Quake usually requires something that's about 10 times more powerful or, or, or more to do a good job. So these guys sat there and they got, they got some liquid nitrogen and they got this refrigerator and all this stuff and they, they actually pumped, they kept pumping this thing and clocking it higher and higher and higher and higher until they actually could play Quake. But it only lasted for a few minutes. <laughs> and at that point, the whole thing just, just fried, just like completely fried, even though they had all this cooling on it. But in any case, that's, I hope that that addresses the issue that it, it depends on you know that abstracting too much um, might sometimes might sometimes not be the right thing if you if you want to if you're trying to project you know what's what's going to happen to the system because sometimes the details will come out and bite you. Other questions? Okay. Um, so there's a paper that, that I've assigned you guys to read, um, so you'll know what lucky bozos are um, by tonight or tomorrow. So let me talk about these three origins of complexity. The first is emergent properties. And so these are properties that show up when components are integrated. So one great example is brain cells. Okay, so you have a brain cell. What does it do? It, it, it transmits uh, electron, it transmits signals, it modifies the signals. Some of them do fancy things like Fourier transforms. Um, but what happens when you put a lot of them together and when you put them in the right configuration? Well, you get sentience, you get consciousness. Like how could you ever predict from, if you just looked at this one cell, that that's what's gonna, uh, that's what's gonna occur? And in fact, that's one of the things that people who study AI love to think is, oh, if I, um, if you guys have heard of neural nets, that was sort of, that was an attempt to say, oh, well, let me simulate what one of these cells does. It's got inputs, it, got out, it has outputs, it has a transfer function that maps the inputs and the outputs. And then let me connect them all, and then let me simulate what happens. And if I can have the right interconnection network, if I have the right funct transfer function associated, then why shouldn't I get sentience or consciousness out of this thing? And of course, we haven't seen that. I mean, HAL isn't around. HAL 2000 uh, never came to be in, uh, uh, in 2001, at least not yet. Um, but, I mean, how can you predict that kind of thing? Well, you can't. In the same way, anyone who tells you that, oh, I can just take a bunch of components and integrate them and, and you know, and, I, and I'll, I'll be able to predict its emergent behavior. Well, you can predict some of them, but there's always going to be some surprise that can come out and, and bite you if it's, if it happens to be the wrong one. What's that? Oh, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> so here's, here's the bridge, actually. <laughs> um, let me pass this around. So, what happened? What happened here? That, that's that's a great great explanation. Um, every structure has a set of, of resonant frequencies, and what that means is that every every structure has certain has a frequencies that it vibrates at more naturally than others. Think of it like a swing, right? If you're pushing someone on a swing, if you if the if the impulse that you give them is coincides with just at the point where they're starting to where they've just stopped and they're starting to go down, then you reinforce. Right, and that becomes the resonant frequency is whatever the frequency is that you're giving that impulse at. Um, there are other frequencies which are which can uh, which can uh, moderate the, the the action. So, for example, if the person's coming up and you push them right as at the lowest point in their swing, you're going to slow them down. So, structures like this bridge. I mean, people said, "Oh, well, let's design a bridge. Great, let's put it up here. Great, you know." And they, they, each part, you know, worked well and blah blah. blah. When they put it up there, what they started noticing was that this bridge would sometimes, you know, start doing this kind of thing. And what they realized was that the interaction between the wind and the final structure was such that it was reinforcing these natural f frequencies of the bridge. So they just kept reinforcing and reinforcing. And if you actually see the movie, you see there's this car, there's this one particular day, there's this car and there's this guy trying to walk off the bridge and the bridge is just going like this. By the way, the bridge out here, the Harvard Bridge, um, from what I heard, I'm, I haven't verified this myself, from what I heard, it actually was the same type of design and had similar types of properties, which is why they went over, why they, after this whole accident, they decided to reinforce it and re restructure it. Another example that I do know of is um, the, the uh, Prudential building, or um, it's either Prudential or the Hancock. Hancock. Hancock has has this property that um, that it's, you know, that it potentially could fall, actually not not on its broad side, but on the on its skinny side, 
And that was something they never checked for because they thought, why would a building, you know, we'll check that it falls this way, but not this way. <laughs> so they actually um, they have a whole floor where apparently they have these these huge water, you know, water jugs, you know, things filled with water, and they have these pumps that kind of pump the water back and forth very quickly to try to compensate for the vibration of the building. Um, so, <laughs> so, so again, you know, <laughs> this is this is why it's hard to build systems because things come up that you you, you think are are never going to be a, an issue, and they do. Um, thir the third example here is uh, really cool. The computer plus internet plus music plus Napster equals equals what? Lawsuits. <laughs> Lawsuits. The R the, the what is R I A A getting really upset. Um, can you imagine? I mean, this stuff here, it's not. There's nothing magic about it, right? You could have anyone could have written Napster the day out, you know, even before the the web was you know, came out. Um, FTP has been around for a lot longer than HTTP. Uh, if the music industry had been able to predict this, what would they? Have, what, you, what do you think they would have done if they could have predicted it before HTTP was around? What's that? They would have built their own system. They would have built. Yeah, yeah, they would have wanted to kind of get control of this thing before it got out, before it got away. I mean, it would have been a could have been a very different dynamic of what we would have had now as the internet if. You know, if the music industry, the movie industry, there's a lot of people who have gotten <clears throat> burnt by the internet by simple applications like Napster that have always been possible. The last one here, um, it won a war, right? I mean, this is you just get some uranium, some conventional explosives. The trick was this high-tech detonator uh, built, the, and that system, you know, can release a lot of energy. Uh, and let me, as a quick, I, I love examples, so I hope you guys, this is a systems course. Do you guys know, um, do you guys know how this, this detonator, uh, interacts with the codes that the president has? So, the way, the, the key here, the, the hard part about this was, you need to compress this, this, these, these pieces of, of subcritical uranium in a way that's, in a way that's uh, isomorphic, so that they're all compressed equally from each side, so that they all com compress into a critical mass that then releases energy. Um, now the trick is, how do you get that compression to be? How do you get the explosives on the outside to explode at just the right time, so that so that all the pressure compresses evenly? Because if you don't, then you just get you know uranium flying out this way or flying out that way, and it's not you know it doesn't really do much besides besides what a conventional explosive will do. Well, this is what the guys figured out. And so the, the, what the president's codes are is for each, war, for each nuclear warhead that we have, or each nuclear bomb, there's, there's a set, there's, it, for each one, this, this is different. So the, these codes basically encode what the sequence is of, of how these things are, are, of how these little explosives go off to do the, so that they compress the, the uranium the right way. So there's no way that you can actually, if you try to explode this bomb by putting in some other codes, it, it'll more than likely just blow up harmlessly, because the codes themselves are what are what determine, are what make the bomb explode, or what make the the uh, the conventional explosives compress the uranium uniformly. So this is a pretty foolproof system. So when you see you know James Bond or someone in you know in one of these movies and they find you know they're able to you know figure out the codes some other way. It's all a bunch of BS, right? It's a, you can't, you can't, you don't know what these are because one, you use the system only once and it's a physical system when it, when it blows up, it either, fish, you either get fission or you get nothing. Um, and again, predictive, predictive, none of these were, are, are uh, the results of these are, I mean, who could have predicted these? Propagation of effects. This is one of these things where you hear, you know, a tree falls down here, and, and as a result, the price of oil goes up over there. Um, there's a lot of examples of these. Uh, there's changing the uh, design to use a non-standard part. Like, for example, suppose you, you had your dream house, and you, your architect had designed it, and you decide, oh, I want to have a bigger door because, you know, I'm I'm going to be a bigger dude, or I'm going to work out, or something. Um, so then you, uh, so what happens? What happens at that point? Well, now you have to redesign the whole house, basically, because now as the doors get bigger, you might have some places where the doors now would jut out into into entryways. You have, uh, you might need bigger doorknobs. The the hinges might not be able to support the doors, depending on what kind you have. It just kind of propagates throughout the whole design. 
Another one is larger wheels on a car. If you change the size of the of a tire on a car, well, now you have to change the size of you know the trunk where the spare is. You have to make that bigger. Well, that might push the the back seats up further, and the, and there might be less leg room, and that might not be safe. So you might have to change this, the you know increase the length of the car, and it just goes on and on and on. So these are the kinds of things that. Um, this propagation of effects makes systems hard to, it's, it's hard to predict when you change one thing exactly how all it's going to propagate. Um, so when, when you're designing a system, you try to minimize that kind of thing. But again, it's one of those things, if someone says, oh, I can just you know, slap one thing in and, and you know, pull this out and put another thing in and it'll all just work, you, know, you have to question that. You have to make sure they know what they've tried it before at least. And my favorite um, here, is in episode four, the original Star Wars. I don't know if, have you guys all seen the Star Wars? First. The first one, episode four. It was episode four, yeah. Um, there's one point where the droids, you know, escape in an escape pod and the, down onto the planet and they have the plans for the, right? And there's some, there's two guys sitting there and they're about to shoot it down and the other guy says, no, don't bother, there's no life signs. And three, two episodes later, the emperor is destroyed and, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> the rebels win, right? Just from that. So things like things like that, um, I mean, it's hard to foresee until they actually bite you. <laughs> Scaling. So this is uh, this is where the overclocking of the processor. A system. The problem is that as as a system scales up in size, speed, or, or other types of characteristics, you get um, behaviors that come out that you might not have predicted. Meltdown is one of them. Um, before Einstein. We didn't think that if you, uh, we didn't know about time dilation and how that interacted with how fast an object went. If you guys have ever, uh, you know, read anything about Einstein's theories, you'll know that as, a, as the speed of an object increases, the time dilation also increases. Or if, if the gravitational force on an object, so as an object ap approaches a black hole, it's time dilation. So time goes slower for, for them relative to everybody else. And, you know, under Newtonian mechanics, you know, what does that matter? But you know, it's actually there's a, you know, a lot of evidence that this is the case um, with Einstein's theory. One of the coolest ones here is, is the mouse. A mouse sca a, a scale to the size of an elephant. So have you guys seen you know some of these movies where you know the the, the ray you know you shoot a ray at a mouse and you, or the ant the ant that you know becomes. Um, so why do you guys have any ideas why do you, why wouldn't that work? Why can't you just the mouse be grown to the size of an elephant? Okay, heat. That's an interesting one. Why? Why is heat? Let's go into that one first. Mass versus surface area. Okay, so the mass. The mass grows as as the volume, which is related to the mass, grows as the cube, right? Roughly, of of the of the of the of the, of the um, radius, right, of this thing. And what about the surface area? As the square, right? So the ratio of volume to surface area. Right, it's not the same at all, uh, you know, as this, as this thing goes up. There's less surface area per volume. And what do we know about a mouse's metabolism? Very fast. I mean, these, right, so they need to give off a lot of heat. What happens if you can't give off the heat to the environment? <laughs> you become a, you become a tasty meal, a hot tasty meal for somebody. So this is <laughs> a big tasty meal. Um, so what can, that, what does that tell you about the metabolism of an elephant? <laughs> very good, very good. Why do you think they have these big ears? They need to radiate heat. <laughs> they can fly. <laughs> they can fly. They need, to, <laughs> they need to radiate heat. I mean, these guys, and, and why don't you see them running a lot? They get in trouble if they get too hot. Um, and now, what, what was the, the other, you, you, you raised your hand. Okay, you're going to say the same thing. What, why, what's another reason that you can't? Yeah, bones. bones, okay. Good. So the so the strength of the bones depends on the cross section, right? Which grows with the square, right? So, and the the volume uh, mass related to mass grows to with the cube, mm -hmm. and so at some point the bones are not going to be thick enough to support the structure, so the whole thing will just kind of collapse. Um, so this is the kind of this is a great example of. Scaling and why it's anyone who says you know my thing scales arbitrarily 
is pulling your leg. Like, don't ever believe it. If Philip comes here and says, my thing just, just scales arbitrarily, just tell, just laugh. <laughs> and tell him I told you. Um, but, uh, but that's, I mean, this, this is the, another thing that, that you have to be careful of is when you're building a system, you have to understand, you know, how, what's the, what are the scaling properties of the system? How does it, how does it perform under, as I build it out? Um, the last one is really cool. I just read about this recently, and, and I don't know if you guys have heard about it. Um, apparently, someone did an experiment where they were able to super cool atoms and make them exhibit uh, quantum-like properties, quantum mechanical-like properties. So you know that you can take light and mold it into this hologram, right? You don't even need to have this special film anymore. There's some example, I think it's Comdex, where they had, um, they just had this this 3D object sort of appear because they, uh, I'm not quite sure how they how they did it, <laughs> but I heard it was really cool. Um, but now they're saying, well, if I mean the, the reason you could do that is because they understood how to bend light and its its wave nature. But now that if, imagine if you could do that with atoms. Well, these guys say that that's one thing that this research will lead to is being able to just shape something out of atoms that they that, that are this way. Not quite sure if it's going to work. Not quite sure you know what, how it's going to how it's going to come out, but it's just like it's just one of these one of these uh, things that this is a scaling down, right? If you t if you bring the temperature down of of matter, you get very different properties than you would expect at the temperatures that we all are accustomed to. Okay, so um, before I get into this, any other questions about complexity and about its role in systems? What I want, the takeaways that I want you to get out of this is. Think about these, these different types of problems that you, that, are, that you have with designing systems. Think about the different types of goals, um, because in the next lecture, we're going to talk about some ways of, of trying to actually get anything done despite all these problems and, uh, and to try to overcome some of these issues so that we can meet some of our goals. When you read your papers, too, make sure that you remember these, you know, the, what the problems are, what the goals are, and try to use that as, a, as an early framework to discuss uh, systems. So now, um, getting more into uh, critical thinking about systems. When you read a paper, I mean, there's a lot of ways to read the paper, and I don't mean like by the pool or by, you know, I mean, you know, what do you what do you get out of the paper? Uh, and I actually like this framework a lot. Um, and this is a framework that I learned when I was taking the grad version of this class. Uh, it was taught by David Gifford. Um, first question is, you need to understand what the problem is that's being solved. For every systems paper you you read. You should be able, to, at the, once you're done with it, you should be able to answer all these questions. What is the problem that's being solved? Very, very clearly, one or two sentence description. And by the way, the TAs may ask you guys this in, in uh, recitation. So be, every systems paper that you read, be prepared to answer all these, all these questions in a one or two, li in one or two line answer. If you can't answer it in one or two sentences, then it's probably you don't understand it well enough. Second, what approach is being used? Approach could be something as simple as, well, they're going to build it. And a lot of systems papers, that's actually what they do. They build it. Um, in some papers, they take a theoretical approach. There's some theory in the Ethernet uh, paper that you're going to read about how much you can load the, the network. Uh, but in general, you know, the, the approach is that they're building it or they're, they're building a prototype or they're doing, they're doing some, that's their, th what they want to do. The experiments that are being performed, so what are they measuring? You know, what are they, what are they, how are they going to measure the, the result, the, the thing that they're building or the thing that they're, that they're doing some theory around. Um, then what are the key results of the experiments? And you can measure a lot of things, but which ones really matter? Which ones really address the problem that's being solved? What conclusions can be drawn? Now, this is the interesting part. There's the author of the paper is going to draw some conclusions. And you might draw different conclusions. You might draw extra conclusions, or you might say some of the, this author's conclusions are BS. Right? But this is something you need to decide what for yourself, what conclusions you can draw from that. And finally, what are the next steps? Every systems paper is going to have a set of unanswered questions. And there can be dozens and dozens of them. But what do you think are, at the most, the three key next steps to advancing the, the knowledge of, of of this problem or to the next problem that arises out of this out of this. And so what I'd like you to do is that every time there's a systems paper, make sure you understand all make sure you can answer all of these. 
there usually would be one, just one paper, sometimes two, where you actually, or I ask you to go into something a bit more deeply, and that's where you're going to write the one pager. But for the other papers, you don't have to, I don't expect you to sit there and understand every last detail of them. If you understand this much of, of the other papers, then you probably understand enough of the paper to be able to go back to it if you need to understand it more, or to be able to, to know whether it's a paper you want to compare, it's a paper that describes a system you want to compare something else to, that kind of thing. Now here's something fun. So apparently, uh, apparently the, using these same kind of mouse arguments, uh, people had, you know, in the last century, decided that it was no use to try to build large flying machines. And the argument they said, well, is that the weight is, or mass, you know, as we were talking about before, grows with the cube of, uh, of, of the size of this thing as a cube. And, but the lift, which is based on cross-section of the wing, grows with the square. So, you know, while small things, at, at smaller sizes, it's not a problem, right? Because the things, you can make them, you can have a really long wingspan, right? Or longer wingspan. As you get bigger and bigger, that, you know, you'll need so much of a, so much of a wingspan that it's just, it's not going to work. Um, and so for a while, a lot of people just said, this is, you're an idiot if you're, if you're trying to build a, a big flying machine, because this clearly demonstrates that. Um, so the point here is, don't believe everything you read, <laughs> obviously, even if it seems to make sense. Uh, and one thing I, I suggest you do is to take this argument here and decide for yourself why you think it's bogus. And it's besides the obvious answer, which is, well, we have airplanes. <laughs> um, you know, think about why an airplane can fly, given this argument. Uh, so that ends this this lecture. Um, what I'd like you to do next is uh, is go to the website. On the website, I have an assignment, which is to read. There's um, let me show you. There's a paper. Uh, there's a URL on there uh, to a paper called Lisp: Good News, Bad News, How to Win Big. Actually, for recitation today, there's one section which I think you'll really love called The Rise of Worse is Better. And I'd like you to read. It's about three pages, three, three and a quarter pages. I'd like you to read that. And there's a little bit of an assignment there um, around scheme, which you all have worked for. Come prepared uh, to discuss that in class. And I'm going to be the one who presents this time in class. And I'm also going to be the one who tries to incite some discussion. So I'd like you all to be prepared to discuss that. The, 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 um, the we're going to have one big recitation today, unlike the other days, one at 1 o'clock. Okay. So um, this should take you, I don't know, 20 minutes to read. Just think about it some. It should be fun. Uh, and we'll see you guys at 1. <laughs>